Hello, my name is Simon Bird and I work with Devon Communities Together. Hi, I'm Freya Granger and I'm a Community Development with Devon Communities Together. And we're going to be talking to you today about empowering employers for a more inclusive workforce in Devon. So, who are Devon Communities Together? Well, we're an organisation that have been around for about 60 years. These are some of the areas that we work in. So enterprise and business, energy, fuel and warmth, learning and training, community buildings, helping people in later life, community resilience, environmental sustainability, grant funding opportunities, and in particular today, we're gonna to be talking about the work that we do with young people. So, Experience Works is one of two projects that are aimed at supporting young people who are neat, and I'll explain what that means in a moment. The other is called Empowering Enterprise. Both these are funded by the European Social Fund and the National Lottery. And Devon Communities Together's role is to engage with employers, to increase awareness and to measure the impact of these projects. And these are some of the partner organisations that we work with to support young people on these projects. So what are we going to talk about today? Um, well, it's important to stress that I'm not here today to try and sell these projects to you. Uh, our main objective is to raise awareness and to talk around what it means to be neat, uh, the barriers that neat young people face and what we can all do to make our workplaces more inclusive. We're not experts. Uh, we'd be delighted to hear your thoughts and experiences so that we can learn together. So, what is it that we mean by neat? So a neat young person is someone who is not in employment, education or training and is not actively looking for work. And the number of neat young people is estimated to be just under 700,000 currently in the UK. And these figures are from the Office for National Statistics. And in Devon, they're estimated to be around 11,000 neat young people. And although we hear a lot at the moment about job vacancies exceeding the numbers of unemployed people, it is important to realize that a lot of NEETs just don't appear in the numbers because they are simply off the radar. Mm -hmm. um, so what factors contribute to becoming NEET? Um, there's many reasons somebody might be not in education, employment or training. Um, and often it's more than one circumstance that brings them to that situation. But um, so there's some main factors here, such as having little or no qualifications, um, being disabled, perhaps, um, neurodivergent, so something like autism, um, ADHD, um, dyslexia, dyspraxia. Um, but what we find with the projects and the young people on them is that overarching all of this is that many of them are living with anxiety, depression, and key to this is low confidence. Um, it's important to say that no two people are the same and that people face a variety of life challenges, but from the young people we've spoken to, these are some of the main factors. Um, in terms of anxiety, this is just a very simple depiction of what it's like. So this is anxiety in the context of starting a new job. Um, a first day at work usually makes most people nervous, but hopefully that anxiety will reduce over time. However, for some people experiencing high anxiety, maybe they've not had a job before, or they've been isolating and disconnected due to COVID or gaps from education, their anxiety might be higher and it might present as quite a big barrier to being able to do the job and wanting to stay in the role. So one way that we can start to change the way we view disabilities and barriers is the social model of disability. Um, the social model of disability, if you haven't heard of it, it proposes that what makes someone disabled is not their medical condition, but actually it's the attitudes and structures of society. It suggests that being labelled erodes someone's security in their own identity. 
And the reason we're highlighting the social model of disability today is because the barriers that lots of young people face um, or the adverse experiences and health problems they might have are not theirs to face alone. And rather than them being the problem and remaining neat, given the right opportunities, they can thrive and move towards their potential. So to describe the social model of disability a little more, um, we can look at the traditional model, which is the medical model of disability. You can see here in the direction of the arrows that the problem is the disabled person. So maybe if they're physically disabled, it might be that they can't walk or they can't use stairs, they can't see or hear. But this can also apply to other things like anxiety, depression or other mental health challenges. And the social model of disability would say that actually it's the world that is disabling. So that might be because of badly designed buildings or discrimination maybe isolation or no access to proper transport. In terms of mental health issues, that could be uh, that society largely values certain ways of, of thinking and behaving. It usually celebrates only a small slice of the true potential of people, maybe preferring qualities like extroversion and sociability, assertiveness. And that actually means that people, perhaps with neurodivergence, or people with high anxiety can be judged for what they can't do or how they don't fit in rather than their strengths and what they can do. This here is just a little picture of, of everything I've just been talking about. So I'll give you a moment to look at that. Okay, so I really hope that's got the, the idea of inclusiveness across. Um, Leading on from that, we can see how difference is actually a strength in workplaces. And now there's been loads of research into this, which is great. And most people would say that diversity in a workplace is actually a really good thing. So you can see with the kind of honeycomb image that it gives lots of benefits, such as faster problem solving, better decision making, higher innovation, increased creativity. And actually the quote on the side is from MI5, who take an active approach in employing people with dyslexia, especially. Um, they say that they have a thriving community of colleagues that think differently, and that people with dyslexia are actually better at looking for patterns and the bigger picture. Thanks, Freya. So I'd just like you to maybe cast your mind back to the first day at work for you. Can you remember what it was like? Um, now, just imagine having high levels of anxiety, no qualifications, and no face-to-face -face contact with anyone for a long time. How would that make you feel? Um, probably not too good. Uh, and that's th the sort of circumstances that many of the young people that we're working with find themselves in. And there are some revealing statistics um, that have been provided by Youth Employment UK. So, for example, only 10% of young people are confident that they will find quality work where they live. And only 25% think that employers are supportive of hiring young people at all. So it's a, a pretty tough hill they have to climb. So how can employers help new starters? So when we spoke to young people involved in the programmes, there were four areas which were really important to them. So I'll just take you through those now very quickly. The first day chat is, is, is one of those, and that's really about putting them at their ease, explaining who they'll be working with, what they'll be doing, setting out the programme for the first few days, and reassuring them that, that someone is there for them to answer their questions and concerns. The next area is about offering ongoing support. So ask how they would like to be supported. Many young people do know their limitations and are good at expressing their needs, but stress often inhibits our ability to concentrate and to remember informa information and to focus on something well. Ongoing support and adopting a clear approach of no question is too small and repeating tasks and responsibilities is a good way for people to feel more comfortable after the stress of the first day. 
Feeling as if they can't ask questions could make someone feel embarrassed and worried about communicating at all. Flexibility is also important. So if a young person needs time to themselves or a late start perhaps due to the side effects, side effects of medication or anxiety about using public transport at rush hour, for example, or if a young person is just having an off day like, like we all do, if their anxiety is high or they've had some trauma triggered, knowing that they can take some time out of the day, that uh, in itself can be hugely beneficial. But we understand that for some roles, this may be challenging, but for roles where work is flexible in terms of hours, extending that kind of trust to the young person to take care of themselves when they need to is really positive. And then the last area is really providing them with a dedicated mentor or someone um, uh, within the organization that can provide them with uh, the answers to problems or questions to help them with issues like timekeeping, transport, and that sort of thing. So what else can employers do? Um, well, in the recruitment process itself, think carefully about what you really need for that job. And we would suggest you don't ask for skills and qualifications that aren't really required. It's better in many cases to recruit for attitudes and skills gained from all areas of life rather than just work experience. So for example, if um, as is the case in, in, in many of the cases that we, we look at, being a young carer for five years develops skills like good time and money management, uh, the ability to manage your own workload, to take responsibility, to be a good communicator, to be compassionate and inclusive. All of these skills are really valuable in any workplace. Um, and it's a good idea to offer job coaching, uh, progression and on the job learning. Being willing to invest in a young person really demonstrates to them that you value them. And offering work experience can be a great way to get young people building their confidence around work, especially after a gap in work and learning opportunities uh, that they won't necessarily have had for the last couple of years during the pandemic. We appreciate that many young people won't be fully work ready, but they can learn very quickly and will always remember an opportunity that an employer gives them. So we thought it would be useful just to touch on a couple of um, ways, different ways to recruit young people. So, um, I wanted to mention, first of all, something called the Magna Vitae, which is an alternative CV for those with gaps in their uh, working life. And it really is an honest description of the candidate's past to celebrate how they've overcome the difficulties that they've had in their life. And it gives an explanation of what they have learned during their journey and describes the events during different periods of their life. And it's always a simple, clear and direct form. And I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Another possibility is to look at video applications, which are obviously a good alternative to lengthy written applications. And providing a space in whatever form of recruitment you use, that young people can talk about their transferable skills from all areas of life. So I mentioned, for example, a moment ago, the young carers who have skills in time and money management and listening skills, organizational skills, and so on and so forth. So all of these things are really helpful in making the recruitment process less intimidating. So here's just a quick example of how a Magna Vitae may, may look. And uh, we'll provide some links to enable you to um, have a look at this in more detail yourselves if you're interested. But as you can see, it's a very simple and straightforward form which gives the young person uh, the ability to talk about themselves more openly um, uh, uh, and explain, if you like, why they've ended up where they are. Um, so that's the, uh, the first page and that's the second page, which uh, again provides them with a, a space to give some additional information. And if they can provide them, obviously, references um, from either their personal life or from previous work that they've had. So as Simon said already, we really appreciate that uh, you may not be in a position to actually offer full-time employment or other employment to young people um, within your business, but there are lots and lots of ways which you can help. Um, 
and you can see from the list below um, you can offer things like workplace visits and tours or mock interviews, taster days, shadow shifts or even some volunteering uh, placements at your workplace. These opportunities really can give people that may not have even had any work experience at all um, and experience in a workplace that can help with their confidence and it can start potentially a relationship where that person can build their confidence and skills and perhaps add to your business in the long run. Um, as an employer, of course, you can invest as much or as little time into helping um, young people who are neat and the project we're talking about. Um, and as I mentioned, we're not necessarily looking for workplaces or jobs, but just suggesting some ways in which it could be really valuable for young people. Um, in terms of supporting your own workforce and the employees you have, um, the Access to Work scheme is a government-run scheme. Uh, it's a funded way to help people with a range of, of um, challenges or needs to be able to enter and stay in the workplace. So there's two organisations that deliver this called Remploy and Able Futures. Employees themselves have to apply for the support, but employers, you can support them in this process. Um, as an employer yourself, you can also get support and advice from the service to your business. And part of the support can include nine months of advice and guidance from mental health specialists. Um, they can help with learning coping mechanisms, building resilience, accessing therapy, or work with you as an employer to make adjustments to help mental health of your employees at work. So there is help out there. Um, and most of the time it's at absolutely no cost. And so just to recap, we wanted to really cover how uh, supporting young people who are neat, offering work experience or workplace opportunities can actually benefit your business. As we touched on previously, diversity is a, a really positive thing for business. Um, and here are some ways in which we think your business can benefit. So we think it will be easier and quicker to fill vacancies locally. Um, many industries, especially construction and hospitality, are finding recruitment very difficult at the moment. Um, opening roles to a broader people like young people can help you fill vacancies quickly. The second we have here is that you could be better adapted to taking on more diverse employees. So increasing um, your confidence as an employer by learning what additional needs are when dealing with young people. Um, can be really beneficial to your business on a general level. So one in four people experience poor mental health at any one time, so it's likely other members of your staff will struggle with that. Having experience and knowledge about some of these issues will help you respond in a better, um, more responsible way. We also think that, as I touched on, diverse skill sets are a great thing. So to create a stronger workforce by bringing different ideas, visions, life experiences, creativity, and so on. The fourth one we have here is to gain a dedicated workforce. Simon touched on this earlier, but offering opportunities where young people may not have been given money can really increase the likelihood that people will be loyal to your business and be eager to learn and gain new skills. Um, number five is to improve your PR potential. So telling your story, sharing your experience of working with projects like these and young people, um, especially in small communities like many in Devon, uh, can give really good PR to you locally. Um, things like this can spread really quickly through communities in a really positive way. And finally, we have strengthening the skills of existing staff as a benefit to your business. So getting more experienced members of your team to guide and train a young person as part of an apprenticeship, for example, can really ignite more passion into your existing team, can strengthen the role of that experienced member of staff um, and help them to feel proud about their place in the team, expand their skill set, and um, make your team overall stronger. Thank you very much. That, can, that brings the uh, presentation to a close. Um, we hope you found that interesting and helpful. Uh, we'd be very pleased to hear from you um, if you are able to offer young people uh, in 
uh, the situation, any of the opportunities that we've described. Um, and also, uh, we'd just also refer you to our website where you can find more resources and some case study videos from some of the young people and indeed employers who have been uh, helping out on the two programs that we, we, we've been talking about. So thank you very much again. Uh, we'll sign off now and we hope to see you at some point in the future. Thank you. Yeah.